Dear friends, welcome back uh, for the second session at the Levdin Symposium this year, December the 3rd and 4th. We have uh, three very interesting presentations for this session that will be between 3 o'clock and 5 o'clock. And then after that, we're going to have an intermission again. Uh, so we're going to have presentation by Francesco Gianturco, Spiridola Mazzecca, and Sharon Hames Schiffer. So let's start with Franco. Are you there? Yes, yes, I'm right here. Oh, pleasure having you here with us. Indeed. So Thanks would you mind sharing your screen with us, please? Yes, here we are. So I started... I start with a little transparency here. Can you can you see this? Well, you're not sharing your screen with us yet. We just see the camera of your nice face. Okay. Well, I, I actually done that, but let me do it again. Yes, please. So is that okay? We still don't see your screen being shared. Oh, here something comes. Do you see that now? We see it now, yes, thank you. Could you go into full screen, please? Oh, yes, this is just the first transparency, which is just uh, reminiscing. First of all, I want to thank Roland uh, for all your efforts and for organizing this meeting. Uh, has been very good so far, and I hope it will progress as nice, nicely and interestingly as it has been up to now. I wanted to show this transparency because it's really reminiscing of a long time ago when in Europe there were essentially two schools, summer schools of quantum chemistry, and I was lucky to be able to go to both of them. And it was interesting to see the differences between the two and the impression that they gave to the young apprentice, how varied quantum chemistry was and how many different fields close to quantum chemistry were actually present in this area. So the, my talk today would be in the sort of example of how varied quantum chemistry could be. And contrary to, I mean, there's a difference from the talks of my predecessor, they will be short in mathematics and long in examples and general uh, transparencies just to give you a feeling of what it means to get into the uh, overall field of interstellar medium. Actually, interstellar medium is a general term that represents a wide variety of environment. But what we really know for those who are been actively present for chemistry is in fact that in general we are in a situation of low temperature. So temperatures in some of the dark molecular clouds can be down to 10 Kelvin. And the number density is really very small. To give you an idea, in one of the laboratories traps that people use to study chemical reactions, even at low temperature, the density is of of the particles are about six to seven times larger than the number that you see listed here. So people usually hand wave by saying that you get a collision every fortnight when you are in the interstellar medium. So these are not really favorable conditions for having chemistry, especially if you think that on top of it, you have ionizing radiation, which is present from the starlight, of course, especially outside the region of the molecular clouds. And therefore you have a lot of other processes that would break up whatever little chemistry you may be having. So gas phase chemistry in that environment cannot really be thought to lead to molecular complexity. This at least is the popular wisdom and it was the popular wisdom for many years in astrophysics too. On the other hand, in the last 20 years at least, the observations that have been, been able to be made from all our observatories, traveling and stationary, and mostly in the last 10 years by the ALMA, the ALMA 
Lumeter Array Observatory, there has really been our astronomical molecular eye has been able to reveal a lot of molecules. In fact, if you look at one of the uh, uh, database that I've listed the first page of this complex catalogs in which molecules go up to larger than 11 atoms. You see a lot of molecules here, plus the family of the polycondensed aromatic hydrocarbons, which are either partly been observed, but most of all suggested as being there. And another database that you might find interesting to look at, the one from Cologne, which is concentrating on molecules and where more than 200 molecules have been detected. It is interesting to see that most of these molecules that have been known to be present in space have really been detected thanks to their rotational transition. So here is another contact with what one might call computational spectroscopy, because I will show in a moment, you cannot really recognize the many lines you see unless you know from Earth what they are likely to represent. So the bottom line is really that if we want to know something about molecule, are there reasons why we want to do that? Well, of course, one of the first reasons is the main reason of many scientific inquiries because they are there. But at the same time, they do tell us quite a bit about the nature of the matter in the interstellar medium because of the different areas in which you detect different molecules. They've been considered important players in guiding interstellar and planetary evolutions because the energy distribution that the molecules can actually give back to the environment is much more efficient than any of the atomic sources. So they are considered to, I will not be talking about it today, but they are really play an important role in the models that we have of the early universe before the recombination era, at the recombination era, and not far from the initial Big Bang. So the question is really genuinely chemical. Which chemistry has driven all these formations? It's interesting to also consider that we are talking in terms of quantities or compositions of the cosmological world that molecules and what the astrophysicists call baryons are really only 3% of this little wedge here that outside hydrogen and helium will give us information about the heavy elements. What, the, as I said, is astrophysically known as the baryons. These are the molecules and the atoms different from helium and hydrogen. As a matter of fact, if we look at it in this composition of the abundances in our solar system, we see that hydrogen is out of scale here because of its abundance. Helium is down here. This is a log scale. But you see the carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, the chief atoms that we know of for many of the molecules on Earth, are in fact the most abundant. So the molecular world has got its own ingredients here. And what we have to do is try to discover how they get together to form molecules. Another important information, which is actually becoming increasingly more important, is the presence of dust. Dust means that when one of the um, supernovas explode, and then you have this scattering in the universe of heavy masses from the planets and the satellites, and all this dust, which is mostly considered obscuring the stars, but also originating from the same explosion, which gives rise to heterogeneous chemistry. And here we have another world in which quantum chemistry and chemical physics play an important role. This is one of the uh, common representation of what would happen in a carbonaceous shell of a silicate core in a dust grain. And the poly uh, we see here that the interaction with absorbed physisorb and chemisorb particles, reactions on the surface, continuous bombardment from both radiation and other particles are really making the problem of understanding chemical formation on grains quite a complicated process. I will not be talking about this today. I'll have to give you examples 
which come more directly from the gas phase chemistry, which traditionally has been one of the routes to the study of the chemical processes. But before I tell you that, I would like to stress again one of the two important pillars, the structural aspect of, of uh, the chemistry in the interstellar medium. So the information that we can get through molecular spectroscopy and the dynamics, the things that we can discover by simulating in the labs, what are the likely conditions for an interstellar object to have a chemical reaction. And in all of this, quantum chemistry is really essential for the understanding of what goes on. So let's look at a picture that again remind us what we could be doing when we look at an astrophysical object. The first thing is, of course, is what I call here step one. And so you need, obviously, collect high sensitivity spectra that will tell you what lines are present and what you're actually observing. Then in order to understand what you're really observing, you need to have a reference. You have to have your laboratory experiments that give you the lines that tells you what happens to the matching of those lines with the various observation. Then all of this has to go on an initial physical modeling. And I will tell you more about this in a moment because you actually have to put together the conditions that are either known or con conjectured about the astrophysical object. So you have to have a model for the radiation transfer codes, the collisional coefficients that come from the chemistry and the physics of the processes involved. And all of this will go into the grand network of chemical and physical processes that will tell you the abundances which can be eventually compared with column densities of some of the observational data. So these four steps are all essential and they are really coming from an interplay between what you can observe directly, and this is one of the dishes of the ALMA observatory, with what you find in the laboratory experiments and what you put together in the modeling of this, which means you have a lot of physical parameters and a lot of chemical reactions that have to come in your modeling. And this is again, something that quantum chemistry has to be very much present in. So you have thousands of elementary reactions, processes involve physical and physical chemical processes, and all of this had to be put into the modeling in order to obtain in the end, the observational comparison. But the unfortunate thing up to the last few years is really that a large fraction of these processes need to be characterized in the laboratory, and they are not, and need to be studied at all with any sort of computational model. So a lot of the databases that would allow people to work a network of processes are really picking these rates out of a hat. So really deciding what a reasonable number would be, but without having any correspondence either with experiments or with calculations. So this is an example, for instance, of what people are trying to do for many processes. This is actually one of the chain formation of, of uh, nitrogen derivatives. All these molecules in the dark atoms and molecules have been observed and all the ones have been conjectured. Some of them might have been observed, but only some in direct, indirect evidence. I'm pointing to this one because quite a bit of study has been done of NH2 minus, which is after all a rather simple molecule to study. And it is a molecule which is essential in the network of all these molecules. And I will come back in a moment in some examples of anions are active participants to these networks. All these reactions have to be known. And this is only one of the participants to the chemical composition. So, as I've just said, this is really the reign of quantum chemistry and of quantum molecular dynamics. And this is really where both um, subjects, if you like, or both sub areas of, quant of quantum chemistry can come in and give a lot of information 
that can be used in the modeling. Um, the modeling in the end is done through the construction of chemical networks, essentially first order couple equations. And this is the evolutionary equations that are set up in the interstellar medium. They're very standard. They're the same type of equations that people use for climate the forecast, but essentially you have to know all the quantities that are listed here. You need, in fact, the various densities of both formation and destruction of the particles, the rates that are actually coupling the kinetics of these particles, and therefore you have decide your initial conditions of the cloud formation and make sure that you're not losing particles or even photons in your evolution. As a matter of fact, our first step years ago was to put together just one of these general codes to treat as widely as possible chemistry modeling in the interstellar medium. This code has been quite successful. A lot of people have been using it, is accessible on the web, and it's called K Rome, honoring the place where I was when we first published this work. And this is really a necessary test of molecular models because you really have to decide once you have the structural and dynamical information, how will they evolve and give you indication on the final conditions. And I'll give you examples of this along the way. The example on which I will concentrate my discussion today is really the fact that there is a large zoo of molecular ions, which are also present, present in the interstellar medium. The reasons are obvious. In the outer region of a dark molecular cloud or a circumstellar envelope, starlight is still ionizing the two most common ingredients, hydrogen and helium, and whatever molecules would be there, while the free electrons produced by this process will penetrate the molecular cloud and so they could either attach to molecules forming an ions, or, or they can combine with the radiative ionization to further produce cations from the neutral present. And this is very important because then ionic reactions are known on Earth to be more effective. And given the very low collision frequencies in the interstellar medium, it is only natural to expect that anionic reactions will be the ones driving most of the processes because also of their long range forces at play. So is there a role for electrons? Electrons actually, what I'm telling here, are a postulate of the way they should be present, but they've been observed only indirectly through deformation of the photon fields in the outer region of some of the um, circumstellar envelopes. So they are expected to be produced at the outskirts of the diffuse clouds because of the, as I mentioned before, the action of starlight. And that would ionize the most um, abundant species which are present there. But the question is that electrons can also be produced inside the dark clouds by the more penetrating cosmic ray. So there should be a lot of electrons sitting out there and giving us, uh, but one of the problem is that only low energy electrons are really relevant for many of the chemical processes that we know. A fast electron will whiz along and will not be able to efficiently interact with the few molecules present there. So how can energetic electrons cool down? Uh, a simple, at least for an astrophysic, astrophysicist's point of view, back of an envelope study, is that if you examine the average density in a molecular cloud and the size that comes from its parsec distribution on the scale of observation, there are enough solar masses there, there will be that the electrons will undergo many collisions. So one of the earliest estimates that came from Alex Delgarno one of the earliest quantum physicists or quantum chemists, if you like, which devoted himself very successfully to astrochemistry. Alex suggested in the 70s 
that because of the momentum transfer collisions under the conditions that I just mentioned to you, then in a few months, the electrons even to up to 10 or even 100 EV will go down to 0.1 EV. And that will bring then the fast electrons to thermalize rather rapidly and be able to effectively enter the chemical chain. And in fact, electrons do enter the chemical chains in a variety of processes. I have listed here some of them. Photo detachment will actually be one of the processes that will destroy, destroy the anions which will be formed there. But the main formation mechanism suggested from the very beginning is the radiative electron attachment. The formation of an anion by emitting a photon by attaching the electron to the molecule. It's a continuum to bound process, which is well known to be handled by quantum molecular problem mechanism. Dissociative attachment is also an important mechanism that can be involving electrons. Associative detachment is also a possibility, which would be a way of losing some of those negative ions present. And dissociative recombination will also be an import. All these mechanisms have been suggested as being active in the interstellar medium and their rates calculated for a variety of simple molecules. The process of course become increasingly more complicated when you get to larger molecules, but the study to two or three, four atom molecules have been done. And we know a lot about the realistic estimate of all these rate reactions involving electrons and molecules of relatively small size. So we, it was not surprised that recently we have been able to observe negative ions in the interstellar medium. The first molecule observed have been a linear carbon chain, C6H minus, is a linear and strongly polar molecule. And I will come back in a moment to show you how important this is for our work. And in fact, we, about uh, 15 years ago now, other molecules have been detected. And they, I'll show in a moment the chain of uh, chain, carbon chain and carbon nitrogen chains and ions observed in the interstellar medium. So these are so far the species that have been detected, directly detected, and they've been discovered in some of the dense molecular clouds. And some people think that such reactive anions are responsible for the formation of diffuse interstellar bands. But these bands yet have not been only part of them. In fact, recently have been able to show the C5 and minus is present in those bands. So here are our questions. Do, the, do we know anything about the formation mechanism? Can we make some educated guess and actual calculations for the formation? Is the molecular, all these molecules have large dipoles. Is this the crucial clue to discovering what happens to the formation of low collision energies? In a moment, we'll explain what these two acronyms mean, and they are dipole bound states versus valence bound states. And in a moment, I'll try to explain how the role would be for the formation of this molecule. So one of the earliest model was in fact about the single, the smallest molecule ever detected, which is CN minus. CN minus has been observed in very different regions of the interstellar medium, and so has been CN. So the model was so that, that the most reasonable way of forming this molecule is by radiative electron attachment. Now, this is certainly a doable calculation, and the calculations has been done a few years back. And unfortunately, the calculations done by Anne Orell's group show that the radiative electron attachment rates are very small. If we look at the regions in which in most of the dark molecular crowds, you will be able to uh, consider the temperature, the radiation, radiative, the REA rates of formation are really negligible. So there must be other mechanisms that 
will form CN minus, and these other mechanisms still need to be discovered. Another option uh, is a direct chemical reaction with H minus. H minus is another puzzle of the interstellar medium. It has been surmised as being there for a very long time. H minus can be formed for ele the, the electron affinity is small but positive. H minus has been considered an abundant partner. It has only been observed in some of the exoplanets and direct observation of H, H minus is still escaping. There has been the densities observed are unfortunately still within the error bar. That hasn't prevented both theoreticians and modelists to suggest that the chemical reactions with neutrals and electrons can be formed in the photosphere where you actually have both species present. So one of the reactions, for instance, that has been considered for the formation of CH minus in the atmosphere of Titan, where CH2 has been observed and so is H minus, is this reaction, which is exothermic. This is a potential energy surface cut of this system, which has been observed and is an exothermic barrier reaction that includes the attachment, as I show here, to the CH2 of the electron formation is CH minus. We have actually studied these reactions and we found that the rates of formations are of, at the temperature of interest of the order of 10 to the minus nine, 10 to the minus 10, which means that CH minus should be observed. There have been various attempts at observing CH minus but none of them has been successful so far. So here we are, we have an example of a prediction, an example of a reaction involving H minus, and at the moment, the observation is still elusive. Another reaction which has been producing um, information on the negative ions is the reaction of H minus with NH3. That will be forming this molecule, which I mentioned before as being uh, uh, sorry, the process is actually exothermic in the other direction. So the formation of NH3 by interaction of H2 will involve production of H minus. And because this rates is found to be fairly large, even in the laboratory, and there is a match between the rate of formation of NH3 and H minus in the laboratory, we think that this could be one of the ways in which because of the presence of some of these molecules, the abundance of H minus would be increased. But to, looking back now at the molecule that I mentioned before, the reaction of H minus with HCN, this reaction was both calculated by us and other people and um, suggested by laboratory experiment. The reaction is again, as you see here, this is the formation of CN minus is a reaction which is exothermic with no barrier. This is the region of the charge exchange that we'll be not discussing this time because of lack of time. But we looked at the rates by studying them using um, time Hunter variational transition state theory, which have used by com optimizing the complex partition function in the multidimensional space of all the species participant. This small, this is a system, a four atom system, so it's not a very complicated thing to do. But the rates that we found are dramatically changing from low temperature to the region of the dark uh, circumstellar envelopes. So the region of the circumstellar envelopes are the one around 100, 150 Kelvin, and the rates are, as you can see, close to 10 to the minus 10. It's interesting that the only rate coefficient known from experiments is estimated at 300K. And this is about one, it is 1 1.5, 10 to the minus 10. And if we extrapolate, I'm not showing it here, our fit to our VTST data, we find that we end up at 1.3, 10 to the minus 10. So we are actually producing very good agreement at higher temperature. 
but we are already finding that the rates of reaction at the temperature that we were looking at for the radiative electron attachment are about um, seven orders of magnitude larger. So the chemical reaction is much more probable than the radiative electron attachment. So one piece of information is that we have to include these rates in the network estimates in order to match, when possible, the density column observed for the molecule. It is interesting that the other larger anions which have been observed, C3 and minus and C5 and minus, can also be formed with reaction with H minus. The reaction behave very similarly. The reactions are largely uh, all exothermic with no barrier. And this is, again, the behavior of the attachment with formation, the C3N. But because of the larger uh, dimensionality of the problem, the calculation is a bit more complicated, but again, is essentially the type of calculation that co current quantum chemistry can really do. And if we look at the rates, we find, as one probably would expect, that the rates are now much larger. We are now getting down to rates to the minus nine in the region of 100 Kelvin. So we are there already with a rate which is comparable with the one actually larger than the one for C and minus. So the chemical mechanism is also an important mechanism with C3 and minus. But the question is, of course, what about about radiative electron attachment to so C3N minus. Now, there is one property of C3N minus that we'll come to discuss in a moment. And it's a molecule with a supercritical dipole moment. The dipole moment is larger than 1.6. And that means that they can support dipole bound states. These are, and apologize for those of you who know everything about this type of states, like Anna is one and a real expert on this. They are nearly Rydberg states of the molecular anions. With the extra electron, it's a very diffuse and very weakly bound species. Now, in the case of the anions that I was showing before, from Cn to C7n, the one which have been considered as present in the interstellar medium, the only one that has a critical, supercritical dipole moment is in fact C3n. So we expect that C3n should support dipole bound states. Why would that be interesting in the present modeling? Well, this is one dipole bound states. There are several, in fact, that we have found in our calculations, and we can find a detailed report in a recent publication, but this is the, sp the orbital spatial description of one of the dipole bound states, which is in the range between two and three MeV. All the ones we found are between one and five MeV. And this is a, an orbital which is very large outside our NC3 molecule on the carbon side, in fact, because of the position of the dipole. And the fact that it is such a diffuse bound state is an interesting, it's an interesting feature because if we simply do the same calculation but for a scattering problem, so we do the calculation on one milli electron volts above threshold, we find that what we call dipole scattering states exist close to threshold on the positive energy range. So this is an entirely different problem. We're now solving a direct scattering problem of an electron from the C3N. And this is on the same side of the dipole bound states. I've only showed part of it because of course the boundary conditions will be different. So this is a scattering state. So it will go asymptotically as a plane wave eventually. But in the region of the volume where the previous state existed, they are very similar in size and shape. And this is a, an interesting point because if you consider that the possibility that the direct electron attachment to the thermalized electrons uh, appears by uh, first forming a radiative stabilization to a very close by states, then you can actually think 
that the process of forming your dipole, your final bound anion could go through the steps that I've sketched here. You come in with a dipole scattering state, which is very similar in shape to a dipole bound state. So the transition dipole moment going from the continuum of the dipole scattering state to the bound dipole bound state will be very large. In fact, we have estimated that for some of the system, in fact, the C3 N minus, and this we found qualitatively to be to the order of 0.9. So that means that this transition moment will be fairly large. The system can emit uh, a photon in this region and form a dipole bound state. And then there will be an electronic or arrangement transition which will slightly deform the molecule. Let's see how we can find bordet now, my Instagram. Sorry, do I have five minutes, did you say? Uh, you have uh, a few more minutes if we're going to have some questions. Yes, I, I'm almost through, actually. Oh, so well. if I may finish with this. Yes, sir. Go ahead, please. The interesting is that the, um, the system C3 and minus has just been observed in, the, in our laboratories in Innsbruck. And this is a photo detachment observation in which the red lines that you see here are actually describing the P and Q rotational line associated with the dipole bound state. The experiment suggests, and notice unfortunately the large error bars, but the experiment suggests that this should be within one and two milli electron volts above the, I mean, below the threshold, which is here. And the photo detachment uh, experiments suggest that indeed C3 and minus can support and has a dipole bound state. So the mechanism for the presence of this intermediate state plays directly a role in the calculation of the radiative electron attachment. So in our uh, modeling of the system, we find that the C3 and minus an upper bound to this radiative electron attachment, I won't have time to explain this to you, is to the order of 10 to the minus seven, which is not far from the 10 to the minus nine rate of the chemical reaction, but much larger to the 10 to the minus 16 for CN that has no critical dipole moment. So the chemical rates can then go directly into the modeling. And this is the behavior in a dark cloud where we show the result of this work compared with what was present before with the Langevin modeling of the chemical reaction. So we see differences and we see that indeed the fractionation of CN minus after 10 to the eight years to the age of that molecular cloud are different compared with the one that one would show from the previous modeling. So whether these substantiate experiments can be seen in this, uh, this is another way in which our kinetic modeling show the population. And I show you this example in which the original estimates of the CN abundance in order to match experiments as to me observation as to me move down. This is the fit in which you use our rates and which we can see that the CN minus is closer to where it's expected to be from the experimental observation. So kinetics modeling can bring you back to decide which molecules would actually be present. So our conclusions are that the Linear anions, this is one only example that I showed you, were observed and can be formed by both free electrons and ions chemical paths. Both of them need to be much more studied experimentally in the lab. There is some evidence that both are present and the electron driven and the chemical path should occur. Whatever it is, quantum chemistry is really central to this modeling and I thank you for your attention. This is the group in the Alpine Mountains and thank you very much for your attention. Can you do his skin a little bit less? Thank yes. you very much, uh, Franco. I see here I have a question from the audience, if I can get that up. 
Yes. Uh, let's see. <laughs> well, I could. I, I have another question here. While I try to get get hold of that question, um, so uh, it, it's very interesting that uh, with theoretical chemistry, as you say, you can mo model conditions which are very hard to achieve in in the laboratory. Yes. And and uh, I really liked the stuff about the chemistry on a grain of dust. But I just wondered whether or not there are any research in the opposite direction, because what you talked about is, is how molecules are formed on a, a grain of dust. Uh, recently, you set, we sent up probes to Mars to try to probe and see if there was life. Could uh, models like the one you talk about find decay products that would be a signature of a carbon-driven uh, environment in which living species were? That is, are there decay products that would be unique for that there existed life? And could you model that? Absolutely. Um, I'm sorry that there are really the world of uh, modelers coupled to quantum chemists in astrophysics due to the variety of observations for the last 10 years is really a very uh, sort of populated area, which is of great interest, I think. Um, but uh, yes, the answer to your question is that uh, the, the study of the heterogeneous chemistry in a grain goes both ways. And the formation and detachment, desorption is a very important process because desorption is invariably driven <clears throat> by photodetachment. So it's radiation that if there are molecules formed on a grain, that eventually either detach those very molecules or detach and fragments them on the way up. There have been a lot of modeling of both ways both from the theoretical point of view and tentative experiments on the laboratory. So the answer to your question is yes, if indeed any of these species were formed on a grain, they could in some cases photodetach intact, simply being detached by the grain from the grain and be then deposited somewhere else in the environment. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. We're a little bit behind schedule. Uh, Jan, uh, Franco, there is uh, a question in the Q&A from one of the audience. I, I urge you to go down and answer that question. You type it in with your keyboard and uh, that answer will be available to all our attendees. So thanks again. I don't see, I only see an answer, a, a question to, to what this. A nuclear quantum effect, is that directed to me, I imagine? Um, it might be longer down in the list. Um, okay. Okay, Thanks. thank you. And okay. now bye -bye then. It's, it's my privilege to invite Spiridula Matsika to uh, join us and to uh, share her screen. I hear something, I see something. I think it's Spiridola's presentation. Uh, can you see it? I can see it on my tablet. Now I can see it. Oh, yes, everything is fine here. Thank you. So uh, okay. you have 40 minutes from now. The floor is All yours. All right, thank you. All right, thank you, Roland. Uh, and thank you for organizing this very nice symposium. It's nice to have everyone together now that uh, people cannot visit Uppsala. So I also wanted to congratulate Nancy and Tom for being the recipients of the Levdin lectures uh, for 2019 and 2020. Again, it would have been really nice if they could visit Uppsala and you are a very nice host. Um, but nevertheless, I think this symposium is, is excellent. All right, so um, I will talk about um, electron-driven processes, and I think the previous talk has been an excellent introduction for the importance of electrons in reactions. So I want to thank uh, Francesco also for, uh, for this uh, nice introduction to my talk. So the long-term goal, I guess, for, for our work in my group 
is to be able to treat photon-driven and electron-driven processes um, at the same level that we can now treat photon-driven processes. So we're particularly interested on the couple of many electronic states. And Wolfgang Donke very, gave a very nice talk earlier this morning about um, how these types of processes can be studied with dynamics. And the field of photon-driven uh, dynamics, reactions driven by photons has been um, <clears throat> really um, progressed a lot in the last year. So we hope that one day electron-driven reactions can also be uh, possible to be studied um, at the same level. There is though a fundamental uh, problem and that is that um, electron-driven reactions are much more difficult and even actually understanding the, the initial states is a much more difficult problem. So we are uh, spending a lot of time trying to understand the initial states that uh, are produced by the um, when electrons are attached to molecules. So uh, we heard uh, uh, in the previous talk a lot about the importance of electrons in intercellular medium. So that is one area uh, where electrons can be fundamentally important. Another area that is uh, closer to the uh, interest in my group is uh, the importance of electrons in electron-driven damage in DNA. So ionizing radiation, of course, we heard can create these electrons. And that uh, when this is happening in cells uh, close to DNA, these electrons can attack DNA. And it has been shown that they can, um, they can lead to, uh, to strand breaks. Um, so this was first demonstrated in 2000. Uh, and since then, there has been enormous amount of work in trying to understand these processes. And um, fundamentally, the first step involves electron attachment to the nucleobases, to the nucleobase part of DNA. And then this can lead to various processes, including dissociative electron attachment in the bases, uh, but also the electron uh, can move to the, to the phosphate in the um, in the backbone, and that leads to the strand breaks that they have been observed. So the fundamental step, the first step in the process here is how the electron is attached to the basis. And this is the step that um, we are interested in understanding better because we need to understand the first step before uh, we understand anything else. All right, so, um, so this problem drives our work and the talk that I will describe will also involve uh, some of the methods on how to describe these things. And, um, and I have broken this into two fundamental um, different regions, I guess. And this has to do with the energy of the electrons that they are attached. So when electrons for low energy, very low energy, less than 3 V are attached, then uh, we have to consider these dipole bound states that we actually, um, they were introduced uh, in the previous talk versus the valence bound states. So um, we will talk about this particular um, problem uh, when we talk about very low energy electrons. But then when we go to higher energy electrons, which are also important, we have to consider that um, state that they are produced, they are metastable, they are embedded in the continuum. So we have to worry about how to treat them properly. All right, so, so my talk will be broken into two, those two different areas. So starting by the low energy electrons, uh, when they interact with the nucleobases, again, we have to consider these dipole bound states versus valent bound states. So just like we heard earlier, the dipole bound states can exist in molecules that they have a very large dipole moment. So the molecule that I am considering here in this study is uracil, so it's an RNA base. And the dipole moment for uracil is 4.7 dBi, so it's pretty large, and it can support a dipole bound state. So you see here the density, which again is outside of the molecule, is a very diffuse um, density outside of the molecule on the positive side of the dipole. Uh, and this has also uh, consequences about how the structure of the molecule is distorted with this state. So in dipole bound states, um, the structure of uracil is very similar to that of the neutral molecule because, because the electron is actually not interacting. It's not outside of the molecule. Now, the valence bound states will be the states that are created when the electron is attached to the LUMO of the orbital. So the LUMO in uracil is a pi orbital, as we see here. And, and here, um, this will uh, distort the geometry of uracil because, of course, um, 
the electron will be attached to a pi star orbital, so the double bonds in the system will be uh, distorted accordingly. So it turns out these distortions, these very different distortions that they are created between dipole bound and valence bound states can be used uh, to detect experimentally and distinguish between those two types of states. So a negative ion photoelectron spectroscopy can be used for that purpose. Uh, so we see the cartoon uh, here, which shows we start from um, the negative ion and a photon um, <clears throat> will uh, detach the electron and, and we can measure the kinetic energy of the detached electron. And if um, the minimum of the anion and the neutral are very similar, then um, the spectrum should be narrow because the frank there is not much vibrational pro progression. And that's actually what you see um, for, for bare uracil from the photoelectron spectrum. So this was measured back in 1998 by Kit Bowen and his group. So this is the signature of a dipole bound state, a very, um, <clears throat> a very narrow peak. On the other hand, if, uh, if there is a valence bound state, as I said, uh, the geometries between the neutral and the anion are very different. So those two minima uh, will be displaced and that will create a vibrational progression uh, that is shown in the spectrum by this very broad um, spectrum, as you see here. Uh, so both of these spectrum have is, spectra have been seen, but if you can notice here, uh, for uh, for isolated uracil, they detect the dipole bound state, while even a single molecule of water um, binded to uh, to uracil produces the valence bound state. So one of the questions that we tried to address was, what is it um, that changes the character of the state? Uh, when we um, introduce a complex of uracil with one water molecule. Um, so, um, <clears throat> so we did the study. So my postdoc, Kate Anstetter, uh, worked on this problem. So this shows uh, the potential energy surface that connects the planar minimum. So the planar structure is corresponds to the neutral uracil, but also corresponds to the dipole bound minimum, which is very similar. So on this side, we have um, the neutral and the dipole bound minimum. And on this side, we have the, the valence bound minimum and they can be connected uh, as is shown in this potential energy surface. And um, all right, so what we see here is actually that um, the, the dipole bound state, so the red curve here is the dipole bound state, the, the black curve is the neutral state and the blue curve is the valence bound state. So at the, uh, at the neutral geometry, the valence bound state is, is stable, is below the neutral state while the valence bound um, is um, in the continuum. And even when uh, we look adiabatically at the valence bound state, it is not stable with respect to the neutral state. So this explains that um, actually uh, what we should detect is the dipole bound state as it is the most stable state. And then uh, Kate calculated the photoelectron spectrum using um, easy Dyson. Uh, and also I should say that these calculations were done with EOMEA um, couple cluster, CCSD. And um, this is um, an ideal approach to um, calculate the electron affinities uh, for these molecules because it has a very good balance between the neutral and the, and the negative ion. But of course we have to be careful with the diffuse orbitals that we add to the system to be able to calculate um, the states, especially the dipole bound state, which is very diffuse. Uh, so we had to add diffuse basis functions on the positive side of the dipole where the dipole bound state is, um, is found to be able to describe this properly, right? So this is the methodology that we are using and then using easy Dyson, we can calculate the photoelectron spectrum. And you see that there is actually a very good agreement with the experiment. And even if we look at the vertical detachment energy, it's impressive how accurate the, the results are. Uh, on the other hand, um, if we were to calculate the, I mean, we did calculate the photoelectron spectrum for the valence state, um, but it is not uh, detected. And that uh, is explained by these um, relative energies for the systems. Now, when we move on to the, um, <clears throat> to the complexes with one water molecule, there are actually four different uh, isomers that they are stable for neutral uracil. Um, 
of uh, uracil with one water molecule. For the neutral system, this isomer one is the most stable. So all of them have hydrogen bonds, uh, two hydrogen bonds with, um, with uh, uracil. And, um, and we have, again, calculated both the dipole bound and the valence bound state for all of the systems, as you see here. Uh, and you see that actually the relative energetics of both the valence and the dipole bound, sorry, the valence and the dipole bound states are different for the different isomers. And they are also different uh, compared to isolated uh, uracil. Uh, so this one is the least stable by dipole bound state. Um, and this one is the most stable uh, valence bound state. Uh, <clears throat> so um, you can see here then that for all these isomers, if we look at isomer four is the one that for the first time, the valence bound state now became, becomes bound um, adiabatically with respect to the, to the neutral ground state. So, so now this can be the stable um, minimum that can be detected. And this again is agreement with experiments and we can calculate the photoelectron spectra and see a great agreement. The um, vertical detachment energy that we calculate at um, almost one EV is also very, very similar to the experimental value. So this is great agreement and it explains uh, how just a single water molecule can actually do this conversion between the dipole bound and the valence bound state in this system which also exists in the other uh, nucleobases, All right? And, and there is, uh, <clears throat> the dipole bound states are also thought of as the doorway states for the, um, for the valence bound states as well. So you can see in this potential energy surfaces how there can be an interconversion uh, between those two states. All right, so, so that, uh, that is, um, I guess, a nice explanation of what happens with the low energy electrons, um, but we have to worry about higher energy electrons because these strands that they have been observed are actually, we look at the cross section for this, um, they're actually higher for the higher energy electrons. So here you see the maxima around seven EV uh, electrons. So we really have to worry about these um, higher energy electrons and see how they are interacting with nucleobases. And if I take uracil again as uh, my example, uh, nucleobase, uh, when we want to see what kind of states are created when the electron is attached, when higher energy electrons are attached, we have to worry about the, you know, the higher valence orbitals. So these are the orbitals for, for uracil, and these are the three pi star unoccupied orbitals that they are created from the, from the pi orbitals. So there are three of them. And the one that I have been talking so far is this one, the first one. So this is the valence bound state that I have been discussing, but there are higher energy, LUMO plus one and LUMO plus two orbitals that they can also um, attach an electron and create higher energy uh, states. In addition, when we are above 5 EV, we also have to worry about states where the electron is attached to the excited state. Um, of, of the neutral system. So here the red arrow is the, um, is the attached electron and it is attached to an electron configuration of the excited state. So there are different types of states that can be created and we have to uh, consider these differences. So a little bit about these different types of states. So this one electron um, attachment, uh, these are all metastable states. So this is the main actually problem with this um, kind of when we want to go to a higher electron is that they're metastable, they're resonances. So we have to worry about this if we want to apply quantum chemistry to study these problems. So this um, one electron uh, states, these are shape resonances and the name comes from, <clears throat> from the shape of the potential of the electron interacting with a molecule um, which has this centrifugal barrier and this is what uh, binds uh, the electron. And it's a one electron process. So by um, one electron being detached, we are in the ground state of the molecule. On the other hand, when the electron is attached to the excited state, this is um, um, in order for uh, relaxation. Um, the relaxation involves a two electron process because the electron will be detached and then this electron has to relax back to the home orbital to reach the ground state of the molecule. So these are two particle one hole or core excited resonances. Um, and they um, behave a little different than the shape resonances. Uh, and even within this group, actually, we have to consider two different cases. So here again, the blue curves are the neutral 
surfaces, the ground state and the neutral excited state, and then the red curves correspond to this resonance, to this core excited resonance. So there are two possibilities. The core excited resonance can be above the, the, <clears throat> the reference neutral excited state. And in that case, a one electron process can relax the resonance to the, to the excited state. Okay, so that is still a shape resonance because it can relax through a one electron process to the excited state. Uh, on the other hand, the, if the energy is below the, um, the neutral excited state, then is, this is a flashback resonance and uh, it cannot relax to the neutral excited state, but it can relax to the ground state through this two electron process. So these are longer lived than the shape resonance, of course, because it involves a two electron process um, for its relaxation. All right, so since we want to use quantum chemistry for these types of problems, um, we have a problem because, um, of course, one can use scattering, and scattering has been used, has been used uh, extensively for resonances. But if we want to use uh, quantum chemistry, quantum chemistry is for bound systems, and these states are embedded in the continuum. So what will happen, I really like this plot that I have taken from um, Anna and Ksenia Bravaya from, from their work, actually, uh, that shows um, what happens when you try to treat these systems with regular quantum chemistry. So the red state here corresponds to the resonance uh, for that particular system. And if one tries to include um, a larger basis set, which one should use if one wants to study anions, then what we see is that there are many more states that appear in the solution. And these are um, the, the states, the, um, you know, the, the, the problem is trying to represent the continuum. So it's, these are the discretized continuum states. So we will have all of the states in our um, calculations and, and that makes um, the problem very complicated. Um, and, and of course, we can also we cannot obtain any information about the lifetime of these states with this process. So we have to do something about uh, that. And a quick and dirty approach would be to do the calculation in a very small basis set. In that case, uh, we have a qualitative representation of the excited state of the resonances. But again, we have no information about the lifetimes and and the. <clears throat> And it's only a qualitative approach if the basis set is small. But I, I, we do that sometimes, and I do have one slide where we have done that. All right. So uh, how do, um, how can we represent? So it turns out we can represent these resonances um, as stationary states with complex energy. And and this um, simple model system here uh, shows um, why this is a good representation. So if we have a complex energy, so the, the resonance states, as you see here, they will be, um, <clears throat> the density will be localized inside this well of this potential. So the potential here is here. So there is a well in the middle where the resonance will be localized, but then uh, there can be tunneling and the density is actually leaks out of this well. Uh, so it's not, um, is not a bound state, is a metastable state. So if we use a complex energy, then uh, we can represent this. We can see this, um, this um, decay here in our, um, in our exponential decay um, in the expression of this. If we use a complex energy for this um, stationary state representation, we can see this decay here, right? So this, in this complex energy, the imaginary part then gives us the lifetime is the width and gives us the lifetime for this state. So if we can um, obtain complex energies from, from our calculations, then we can have information both about the position of the resonances and also about their widths, uh, which is the inverse of the lifetimes. And there have been several approaches on um, how to do that. And uh, the approach that we have uh, used uh, mostly, uh, although we have tested some other uh, approaches, but the one that we have used mostly is the orbital stabilization method. As you can see in this reference, this is a pretty old approach. Um, <clears throat> and, and it's very simple, and it doesn't involve um, modifying any of the quantum chemistry codes. So um, 
as actually was seen in this plot, what you see here is that if we include more diffuse functions, so if we change the diffuseness of our basis set, um, the energy of the resonance states is not affected very much. And there will be some changes, but it's more or less stable. But these discretized continuum states um, are affected uh, dramatically by this extra diffuse function. So basically, we can um, make this plot more quantitative uh, by using an alpha parameter which scales the exponents of the Gaussian in the basis sets. And if we plot then the energies that we obtain as a function of this alpha parameter, then we get all these states that they behave differently. So they will be crossing and there will be avoided crossings with these them. So there are several states as you see here. And one of these states seems to be stable with respect to this alpha parameter and that will correspond to the resonance state. And uh, <clears throat> on the other hand, these um, couplings here, which couple this continuum-like discretized states with the resonance state represent the coupling between, um, between the, the resonance and the continuum. And, and we can explore these avoided crossings to obtain information about the, the widths of the resonances. Uh, <clears throat> so we can do that by analytic continuation, uh, where we um, analytically continue the, the real energies to the complex plane, and that will give us complex energies. And these complex energies then um, can be used to obtain the, the energies and their widths. So when we find the stationary points of these complex energies, we obtain um, the, <clears throat> the complex energies uh, corresponding to the resonance energy and width. And that's what we do. I don't want to go into details, but actually, I mean, the way we do that is we go, we uh, we use the generalized per day approximant. So we fit the energies around the avoided crossings using these polynomial expressions, and then we use those for analytic continuation. All right, and then the second problem is um, what type of electronic structure methods we want to use. Uh, <clears throat> And, um, and I list here the two types of methods that we have used, and there are advantages and disadvantages for each one of those. So as I mentioned earlier, EOMEA uh, CCSD is ideal for uh, very accurate electron affinities. And actually we demonstrated that when we looked at the dipole bound states. So this is an ideal procedure and can um, help us obtain the resonances, but it does have a problem. It's very difficult actually to obtain these core excited or flashback resonances. Uh, from this approach, uh, and we can obtain at least one of them on a given system, and I will show how we do that, but in general, it is difficult to obtain them. Um, and the other problem that I will show in my examples is that there can be a coupling between the shape and the feshbach resonances. And again, if, if we cannot obtain both of those from the same calculation, we cannot, um, we cannot obtain this coupling. On the other hand, multi-reference methods, and here I have different variants that we have used. So we, we are using uh, MCSCF or MRCI or perturbation theory, multi-reference methods. And, and with those methods, we can obtain both shape and feedback resonances and the coupling between them, but it is more difficult to obtain accurate electron affinities and the balance between the neutral and the negative ion uh, correlation can be tricky. All right, so I will uh, demonstrate how these methods work and I will discuss more their advantages and disadvantages by talking about benzene. So um, as I mentioned, we're going to study nuclear bases and we did study nuclear bases, but benzene is the most basic organic conjugated aromatic molecule. Uh, so this will help us introduce the concepts of, of what we need um, to be able to calculate the resonance in the nuclear bases. So benzene has this nice um, six pi orbitals, which are uh, also degenerate because of the high symmetry of benzene. So when we do electron attachment to benzene, uh, we can uh, create shape resonances by attaching an electron either to the LUMO, E2U degenerate orbitals or to the B2G higher uh, pi star orbital. Uh, and we can also create core excited resonances by attaching the electron to the excited states of benzene. Uh, because here we are interested in the higher energy resonances and we are interested particularly 
in the coexistence of shape and core excited resonances, the resonances that we paid attention here are the B2G shape resonance and the, and the core excited resonances that they are created. Of course, there is the E2U ground state, the lowest energy resonance. Um, but we did calculate that, but I'm not going to discuss this here. All right, so these are the stabilization curves from couple cluster. And, <clears throat> and we have to use exit diffuse uh, functions on the carbons here. And this alpha parameter shows how we change them. We scale them, <clears throat> the exponent for the Gaussians and we obtain the energy as a function of the alpha parameter. So these are the stabilization curves. And here you can see a nice avoided crossing. It's a very wide avoided crossing for the shape resonance. And we obtain that by you by starting from the ground state, the singular ground state. So if we start from the singular ground state and we uh, attach an electron, then we will get the shape resonances. Um, so that's what we get here. Now, as I said earlier, from these calculations, we cannot obtain the core excited states, but we can obtain the core excited state if we start from a triplet ground state. Because as you see in the configuration, if I start from the triplet, so then a one electron attachment will give me the core excited state. So this is the trick that we are using to obtain um, the core excited uh, resonance in this case or in all of our cases. The problem here is that we can only obtain one of them, which will correspond to the reference ground state triplet state, but we cannot obtain more of them. And of course they come from different calculation. So any coupling between those two will not be represented in these calculations. Uh, when we do multi-reference, calculations, so here is MRCISD, we see that from one calculation, um, we can, if we have the appropriate active space, we can obtain both of those states, right? So you see this wide avoided crossing corresponding to the shape resonance, and then we have this feedback, uh, it's not feedback actually, it's, um, it's a core excited shape resonance. Uh, here, and we also have a second one, right? So both of them, there are more than one that exist in this energy region. And here we could only obtain one, but, but in the MRCI calculations, we can actually see uh, both of them, um, right? So, so the nice thing here is that we can obtain them from one calculation. Then we can actually analyze these results and, and look at the numerical results and see how they compare. And, um, what we see here is uh, that the couple cluster results, the position of the couple cluster results is actually very, very similar to the MRCI results for both of them. So this is the shape resonance, the position and the width in parentheses, and this is the core excited with the width in parentheses. So the positions are represented well by both couple cluster and MRCI. We also did ras -SCF, um, um, so special type of MCACF, and here the positions are actually have huge errors. So dynamical correlation is very important for these resonances. Now the widths on the other hand um, are not so similar. And, and here they're actually okay for the shape resonance, but for the core excited, we have orders of magnitude variations between the widths, uh, between the different, different methods. All right, so, so now I, I want to talk a little bit about the coupling between those two, because that's the one thing that we are um, very interested in. So I have talked about benzene, and in benzene, actually, here, these are um, all the different resonances. So this is the quick and dirty calculation. So we can actually look at all the different resonances by doing a very small basis set calculation. So this is the negative ion of benzene with a very small calculation. And the two resonances that I have been discussing are over here. So this is the shape resonance has a B2G symmetry. And then the first core excited resonance has a E1G symmetry. Um, this will be the ground state. And then there are higher resonances, right? So, so these are color coded with respect to symmetry. So you see here that those two have different symmetry when you consider this 6 h symmetry. So coupling between them should not be a problem if we only consider this 6 h symmetry. But but there are vibrations, of course, which we don't he have here. But also, uh, there is a Young-Teller effect. So we talk we heard about the Young-Teller effect earlier this morning uh, by Wolfgang. And uh, actually, he mentioned benzene cation. Well, this is benzene anion, but it's a similar story, right? So now you have a one electron into the LUMO, which is also degenerate. And that will create a Young-Teller effect. So it will create 
and distortion um, of the geometry of the anion. And actually in this paper, Bartlett and his group explored this and they looked, so this would be on the ground state. So this is the ground state. And if you explore the young teller effect and the distortion that it causes, then the degeneracy will split. And that's what you see here. And the, and the symmetry will be um, <clears throat> lowered. So in the lower symmetry, those two states, the resonances that we are interested in have the same symmetry. And if they have the same symmetry, they should um, mix. And when they mix, that should have important consequences for the width particularly. So the position also, but the width should be very sensitive to, to the mixing between uh, those two states because one of them is very broad. So if you can see in the results here, one of them is very broad. So it has a very short lifetime, but the other one, is very narrow, so it has a very long lifetime. And with whichever number you want to believe here is a much different than this number. So if we have a mixing of the wave function between those two, we should expect the widths for both of them to be quite different. Um, and um, that is an issue that we are interested in. So in benzene, we have seen the wave function mixing in the DC, uh, in, in the, well, we have seen it here as well, but, but we are also exploring the mixing in this case. Now, why are we interested in this mixing? We're interested in this mixing because it turns out it is really important for the nucleobases. Um, so these are all the different nucleobases. And some time ago, uh, we actually looked at the resonances uh, for those. And um, all of them have pi orbitals similar to benzene. So they have shape resonances and they also have core excited resonances. And there is always a core excited resonance and the third shape resonance and the, that they are close in energy. And these are color coded. So the yellows are always the shape resonance and then the green is the core excited resonance. And if you look across the bases, you see how the energy shift and they are, but they're always similar. So here the gray is the shape resonance. So the, there, there is coupling and actually we have seen that in our calculations that there is strong coupling, actually much stronger than benzene in these calculations. And then and then this mixing will affect the widths. Unfortunately, in these calculations, we had to do them with a smaller basis set. So we were not able to calculate the width um, to actually see what the effect is. But I show only the results. So this is, I guess, my last slide. So I will show only the results. Again, comparing the couple cluster with, with multi-reference perturbation theory. Which, so here we have the mixing and that is shown in the positions that is different, even the ordering of states is different from here. And that's caused by the mixing. But again, what will happen is that the widths which represent the lifetimes will be different. And that's it, what we actually are trying to calculate more accurately, to be able to obtain the widths more accurately, to see this effect of this mixing. And this is very important. Again, these are the nucleobases now. And this is the energy range where um, the, the electrons are should be very important. Um, the, the attachment of electrons should be important. So it's a very important problem to figure out. So in conclusion, um, the electron attachment to nucleobases, um, I talked about dipole bound and balance bound states, which is really important for the very low energy close to the, close to the ground state. Um, but when we go to higher states, we have to worry about resonances and modifying appropriately electronic structure methods can give us information about this. Um, but, and there is mixing and all sorts of problems that we have to worry about, but we still have a lot of work in terms of obtaining accurate widths that will explain the role of these states and their lifetime, which is very important. All right, and um, I stop here. Uh, Kate and Mushir are uh, my current, so my postdoc and my student who actually worked on these problems that I presented today. And there were previous uh, members, Mark and Tolga, who also worked in, in, in some of this um, when they were in the group. And again, I want to thank you all and thank Roland for um, for this nice symposium. Thank you very much. Uh, we just got in a question here. I have some other if, if uh, we have time. So let's start with a, a question from the audience here. It's from uh, Nicholas. He asks, how do you deal with continuum continuum coupling in the case of mixing between Feschbach and shape resonances? 
Right. So, so the that is the coupling that we are interested in, right? So here we are, um, we are looking at those in terms of our um, orbital stabilization curve. So we are using the the regular quantum chemistry methods, and the continuum. Um, I guess we don't have a continuum, but but we have we only have the positions and the width. So, I guess that we can only calculate indirectly this mixing by how we calculate the um, the positions and the width so in the widths we will have we will see a direct effect but we don't have i guess directly a continuum um in our calculations so we can only see indirect effects again i i urge the speakers to go in in the q a and look up the written questions and possibly write and written answers which everybody can look at those of you who are asking the questions I suggest you put the initials of the presenter first. There was some confusion with respect to some questions here, who was being asked or not. Before we leave you, Spiridula, I have another question here. So sure. it's, it's, of course, very complicated describing these uh, states that are not bound and stuff like that. And I, I noticed that you seem to be advocating, or at least this is what you're using, a, a augmented atomic basis set, uh, whereas <clears throat> I come from a family where we like to use Kaufman-like Rydberg orbital basis. The, the advantage of the latter is, of course, as my molecular system increases, I will not be in a situation where I potentially run into linear dependency of all these diffuse functions that are all over the molecule. Could you tell me a bit how, you, how you're thinking and dealing about this, please? Right, so um, we, have, we have only used these um, atom-based basis functions. Um, and we, we, have, we don't have problems with linear dependence because unfortunately for the molecules that we want to study, we cannot do very large basis sets, which is a drawback. Um, but but we are um, but on the other hand, we, we can do them. So I don't know exactly. Yeah, I don't know exactly how they would compare. And uh, our experience is that uh, you would have a very few more uh, basis functions for the diffuse part mm -hmm. of the wave function, whereas here. I mean, you had your molecular system that extended over, over space, and you have the blob here. I guess there are plenty of basis functions over the other side, which you don't use. Yeah, well, for the dipole bound states, we actually only put the diffuse functions where the blob is. OK. <laughs> How did you know it would be there? It depends on the dipole. So the, the dipole bound state, the, the, the electron attaches on the positive side of the dipole. So in that case, it, it's actually established that you can do that. But you are right. It's it's not a black box approach. All right. Uh, with that, uh, thank you again. Again, I invite thank all, you. all the attendees, if you have some further questions to Spiridola, down in the Q&A, write SM colon and post your question and Spiridola will answer it. With that, we proceed with the third presentation this second session and i invite sharon to the webinar hi sharon how are you doing oh very well thank you uh let me share my screen so finally we we have you here you were supposed to be here 2018 and you couldn't come but this that time you, you're gracious enough to show up thank you Yes, no, I'm very glad to have this opportunity. And I was sorry not to, yeah, to miss the other one. It was a health reason that uh, unfortunately was unavoidable. But uh, but I'm really happy to be here now. And uh, I thank uh, Roland for organizing this uh, symposium. We'd all rather be in, in Sweden, but uh, but this is certainly a really nice opportunity to share some science. Yeah, thank you very much. You have some 220 people listening to you now. So the next 40 minutes, that's yours. Okay, wonderful. So I'm going to use these 40 minutes to talk about multi-component quantum chemistry. 
and how we're using it to integrate um, electronic and nuclear quantum effects via the nuclear electronic orbital method. So we're moving uh, beyond electrons, which we've heard about uh, in the past two talks, to add protons. And nuclear quantum effects are important throughout chemistry and biology in terms of zero point energy and vibrationally excited states, in terms of hydrogen bonding interactions, in terms of hydrogen tunneling, and my personal favorite, proton coupled electron transfer, or PCET, where an electron and a proton can transfer simultaneously between different donors and acceptors in many cases, and they could transfer in the same direction or in opposite directions. And in some very complicated processes, such as photosynthesis, we have many electrons and many protons transferring in different places and in different directions. And over the past 20 years or so, my group has developed a general theory for describing PCET. And we describe the transferring hydrogen nucleus quantum mechanically and, and describe the reactions in terms of electron-proton vibronic states. And we found that non-adiabatic effects are very important. So the Born-Oppenheimer separation between the electrons and the transferring proton breaks down. And so this was actually the motivation originally in developing this uh, nuclear electronic orbital or NEO method um, that we've been developing in my group. And although it's much more generally applicable beyond uh, PCET. So in NEO, we solve a mixed nuclear electronic time independent or time dependent Schrodinger equation with molecular orbital methods. And we treat specified nuclei quantum mechanically on the same level as the electrons, typically we treat only the key hydrogen nuclei quantum mechanically, and then retain at least two classical nuclei to avoid complications with translations and rotations. Or an alternative approach would be to remove the translations and rotations. Hardy Gross has done some um, seminal work on this. That leads to extra complications. And we're, uh, we're really interested in having a method that's computationally efficient so we can study relatively large chemical and biological systems and also a method that's simple enough for the general chemistry community to use. So the advantage of this NEO method is that it includes the proton delocalization and zero point energy effect during the geometry optimizations, the reaction paths, and the dynamics rather than including them as corrections. And it includes non born oppenheimer effects between the electrons and the protons. So for example, for malonaldehyde, we might treat this transferring hydrogen nucleus quantum mechanically and all other nuclei classically or for H5O2 plus, we could treat all five protons quantum mechanically and just the two oxygens classically. Now within this framework, the simplest um, approach here is to start out with the Hamiltonian, where we have, um, we've divided the system into any electrons, NP quantum nuclei, which are typically protons. So in this talk, I'll be calling them quantum protons, but they could be other nuclei, or they could even be positrons. And then we have NC classical nuclei. And then the Hamiltonian includes the standard electronic terms. You have the kinetic energy of the electrons, the interaction of the electrons with the classical nuclei, and electron electron repulsion. And then we have the analogous terms for the quantum nuclei. And then we have this term here that's the nuclear electronic interaction term, the attraction between the electrons and the protons. So starting with this Hamiltonian, we can then solve the time independent Schrodinger equation, H psi equals E psi where all we've done is taken some of the nuclei, these key protons, and put them on the other side of the semicolon. So now we're basically, our wave function now depends explicitly on the coordinates of the electrons and these quantum protons, and it depends parametrically on the classical nuclei. And you can see that down here in the picture, we have electrons and we have the light nuclei, the protons, on the quantum mechanical side. Then this line indicates the semicolon, or you could say the Born-Oppenheimer separation, and the heavy nuclei are on the other side, and they're treated classically. So now our potential energy surface in this NEO framework depends only on the classical nuclear coordinates. There's a reduced dimensionality potential energy surface. So with this in mind, we start out with neo hartree fock right? This is the simplest wave function you could come up with, and it's just the product of an electronic and a nuclear Slater determinant. And these are composed of electronic and nuclear molecular orbitals, that we expand in Gaussian basis sets. And then we just minimize the energy with respect to the electronic and nuclear molecular orbitals using the standard variational method. And this leads to two sets of hartree fock equations, one for the electrons and one for the protons. And of course, these depend on each other because these Fock orbitals, each one of them depends on both the electronic and the protonic coefficients. So we need to solve these iteratively until self-consistency. 
And this is straightforward to do. Along the way, we also optimize the uh, nuclear basis function centers as well, variationally. But there's a problem. And the problem is that this leads to an inadequate treatment of electron-proton correlation, which is very important. So I like to view electron-electron correlation as icing on the cake. It's quantitatively important, but it doesn't change the overall qualitative behavior for the most part in most cases. But electron-proton correlation is the cake itself. It's extremely important because of the attractive interaction between an electron and a proton compared to the repulsive interaction between two electrons. And as a result, within this neo hartree fock or NEO-HF, uh, a method, the proton densities are much too localized and the hydrogen vibrational frequencies are much too large. And when I say too large, they're large by thousands of wave numbers in many cases. So all of the properties are unreliable. So clearly we need to add electron-proton correlation. It's essential to getting even qualitatively reasonable results. And there are two different ways to do this. One is density functional theory and the other is wave function theory. And we've been exploring both paths I'm going to start out by talking about density functional theory, multi-component DFT, which is just DFT with more than one type of quantum part. And the Hohenberg-Cohn theorems have been derived for multi-component systems way back in 1982 by Parr and coworkers. So the total energy now is a functional of both one particle densities, the electron and the proton. So we have the interaction of the electron and proton densities with the external potential, the classical nuclei, and then we have some universal functional that depends on both electron and proton density. Then if we extend the Cohn-Sham formalism to the multi-component framework, we now get this uh, non-interacting kinetic energy and classical Coulomb energy term. And here the Coulomb energy includes electron-electron, electron-proton, and proton-proton. So that's all in there. And then we have three types of functionals. We have electron exchange correlation, which depends on the electron density proton exchange correlation, which depends on the proton density. And then we have electron-proton correlation, which depends on both densities. And if we had all of this, then we could just use the variational method and we get two sets of equations, one for the electron and one for the nuclei, that we can solve self-consistently, completely analogous to what I showed on the previous slide for hartree fock But of course, the trick is, what are these functionals? Well, electron-electron exchange correlation is pretty straightforward. We can just use the standard electronic functional. B3 lip, PBE, whatever your uh, favorite flavor is. Proton proton exchange correlation is negligible because the protons are highly localized in molecules. So we can just use the, uh, include the diagonal Hartree Fock exchange to eliminate self interaction terms, or often we just include all of the Hartree Fock exchange for protons. It's the easiest way to deal with it, and it's sufficient. Electron proton correlation is where the problem lies. So for this, we needed to develop new functionals. And what we did is we did a multi-component extension of the Kolsov eddy formulation, where now the uh, inverse correlation length depends on both the electron and the proton densities instead of just the electron density. And after a series of mathematical manipulations, we got a local density approximation, or LDA, functional. We call these EPC 17, one or two. 17 is because they were developed in 2017, and EPC stands for e electron-proton correlation. And you can see this is the form of it. It's relatively simple. It has three parameters, A, B, and C, which differ in the one and the two versions of this functional. And we've extended it to the generalized gradient approximation, so GGA, that was in 2019, so we call that EPC-19. And this one also depends on the gradient of the density. So this is analogous to LYP in electronic structure. So once we have these functionals, we can test how they do. And first, we'll look at the proton densities with EPC-17-1. And this was tuned especially to get good proton densities. And what I'm showing here are two different molecules, FHF- and HCN. And we're plotting um, the density of the proton, which is treated quantum mechanically, along with all the electrons, as a function of position for the on-axis and the off-axis coordinates. So basically, along this, these two coordinates are shown here. And the black curve here is the reference. That's a grid-based reference that's uh, numerically exact for the system. And the red curve is NeoDFT with no EPC, so no electron-proton correlation. And you can see that the proton density is much too localized. These are all actually normalized. It's just the wings where, um, which account for the difference of the different look here. So e no EPC is clearly much too localized. But when we do NeoDFT EPC 17, we get this blue dotted line here. And we get very good agreement with, with the um, reference density. 
for FHF minus, it's, it's really good agreement for HCN. It's not quite as good, but still a huge improvement over no EPC. What about energies? Well, here we use EPC 17.2, which is tuned for energies. And actually, EPC 17.2 also works very well for proton um, densities, not quite as well as what I showed on the previous slide, but still very well. And so we tend to use EPC 17.2 for most of our applications these days. So to test energies, we computed proton affinities for 24 different molecules, diverse molecules. And the way we did this is we did a conventional DFT calculation on the molecule without the proton. And then we added the proton, treating it quantum mechanically with NeoDFT, and we calculated that energy, and we took the energy difference. And then you have to add 5 halves RT to convert to a proton affinity. The mean unsigned error compared to experiment is 0 0.06 eV, and that's quite good. Here's the um, calculated versus experiment. You can see we have good, good agreement, good correlation. If we include no EPC, then we get 0.78 eV, much worse. Now, if you were to do a standard DFT calculation with just harmonic zero-point energy corrections, you would actually get 0 0.05 eV. So it's, it's quite similar, but this requires a Hessian. It does not include anharmonicity, which we'll see later is important in some cases. And the nuclear quantum effects are not included during the geometry optimization. And this is another advantage of NEO, that we can include proton delocalization, anharmonicity, and zero-point energy in geometry optimization. For example, this is the FHF minus molecule. Again, the hydrogen nucleus is quantum along with all the electrons. And we can optimize the FF distance. So find the equilibrium FF distance. And if we do this with our reference method, our grid-based method, we get this black curve. If we use just standard DFT, where um, the hydrogen is classical, we get this green curve. And if we use NeoDFT EPC-17, we get this blue dotted curve. And what you see is that the proton quantum effects increase the distance compared to standard DFT. And the ODFT EPC-17 is able to reproduce this increase. And that happened naturally. We didn't actually fit to this. So that's ground state information. What about excited states? Well, for excited states, we've developed NEO-TDDFT, where we look at the linear response of the NEO-Cone-Sham system to perturbative external nuclear and electronic fields. And our working equation couples electronic TDDFT and protonic TDDFT. You can see these red boxes show the electronic TDDFT part. The blue boxes show the protonic TDDFT part. These Cs couple the electrons and the protons. They're also very important. So in this method, we can compute both electronic and proton vibrational excitations in a single calculation. And the cost is similar to electronic TDDFT, taking into account the larger basis sets that we need to use. So how does this do? Well, we first can look at electronic excitations. And we look at FHF minus, the lowest two triplet and singlet uh, excitations. And um, we just compare to standard TDDFT, and we see that the electronic excitation energies are very similar. And so in this case, the proton quantum effects do not significantly impact the lower electronic excitations, but they do have a greater impact for higher excitations due to vibronic coupling, which we'll see later in the talk. But for now, we just see that they're quite similar for these lower states. Now we can also get proton vibrationally excited states. So for example, in FHF minus, we can get the bend mode and the stretch mode. And we can compare these proton vibrational excitations to a grid-based reference. And that's what we do in this table here for FHF minus and HCN. Again, the hydrogens are quantum, everything else is classical, and the electrons are also quantum. Now this requires a relatively large electronic and protonic basis set. But if we do this, we can get these numbers here where you see the errors are less than 100 base numbers. And keep in mind that that's only like 0.3 kPa's per mole. So it's, it's, it's quite good agreement. And most of them are actually even better. They're, they're around 20 wave numbers with respect to the um, exact answer. And we get similar agreement for other systems, including open shell systems. So this is all fine and good. But in these calculations, the classical nuclei had been fixed. And that's not going to give us information about what you'd see in an IR spectrum, where all of the nuclei are so one of the challenges that arises in the NEO framework is how do we compute vibrational frequencies that correspond to modes composed of both quantum and classical nuclei? Because I've already told you that the NEO potential energy service depends on only the classical nuclei, right? Because the quantum hydrogens respond instantaneously. They're being treated like electrons. So then our NEO hashing will produce modes that depend on only the classical nuclei. So one of the strategies we've used to solve this is to couple the NEO-DFT Hessian for the classical nuclei with the NEO-TDDFT for the quantum nuclei to obtain these vibrational um, excitations for the whole molecule. So for example, um, in HCN, 
In this case, our neo-Hessian will produce only a single mode, just the CN stretch. It's almost like a diatomic molecule, right? Because the proton, the hydrogen is being treated as, a, as an electron. So we get only this one mode, but neo-TDDFT I showed you on the previous slide gives us three modes. It gives us the doubly degenerate bend and a stretch, and it does it quite well. It's quite accurate. We compared on the previous slide to grid-based methods. So we can take this information from the neo-Hessian and the neo-TDDFT calculation and combine it to get these neo-coupled vibrations. So now these vibrations involve all of the, the nuclei, both classical and quantum, and we get all four modes. And the way we do this is something we call neo-DFT V. V is for vibration. So we generate an extended Hessian that depends on the classical nuclear coordinates, RC, and the expectation values of the quantum proton, RP here. And so what you can see here is now this, uh, this extended Hessian is the dimensionality of all nuclei, both classical and quantum. And this H0 part, the red part here, is the second derivative with respect to the classical nuclei with fixed expectation values of the proton. H2 is the second derivative with respect to the expectation values of the protons with fixed classical nuclei. And H1 then would be the cross, not cross terms. And we get the H2 information from neo-TDDFT calculations. Once we have that, we can get H0 and H1 through rigorous mathematical identity. And so once we have this extended Hessian, we can diagonalize it. And then we get coupled vibrational frequencies that depend on both the classical and the quantum nuclear coordinates. So to see how this does, we can go back to HCN, right, which I showed before, and look at the CH stretch. So you can see that a conventional harmonic calculation, so just a regular DFT where you just do harmonic uh, frequencies, uh, we get uh, about 100 wave numbers higher than the experimental value. But if we do NeoDFTB, we get spot on, you know, within six wave numbers. So it brings it down by 100 wave numbers. And it also agrees with conventional and harmonic. This is basically regular DFT with a BPT2 correction. So we see that including anharmonicity with Neo decreases the frequency for the CH stretch relative to the conventional case. And that's the advantage of adding the anharmonicity in this way. We've looked at other systems, these other molecules shown here. And we've even looked at systems with, with two quantum hydrogens, these ones listed here. In this case, we find that NeoTDDFT is able to get uh, excitations for collective proton vibrational modes. And that's because these are just linear combinations of single proton excitations. So, so NeoTDDFT can get those. And then we can combine those in our extended um, Hessian with our NeoDFT V method. And we get the molecular frequencies for the entire molecule that mix both protons with the, with the classical nuclei. And we, find that these frequencies agree with experiment for the most part, and also with anharmonic calculations, the BPT2 calculations. So we can get frequencies. What about transition states? So for neo-transition states, my student uh, Patrick uh, derived and implemented analytic Hessians for neo hartree fock and Neo-DFT. And this, this work is still in progress, but we have some results for neo hartree fock where he computed transition states and analyzed the imaginary modes. So looking at the simple hydride transfer reaction, where hydro hydrogen is transferring between these, these two central carbons here, we know that for a conventional hartree fock calculation, the transition state is going to look something like this. The hydrogen will be in the middle, right? And the, and the imaginary mode will be dominated by the hydrogen motion. And you can see that here. This is a picture of the imaginary mode for a conventional um, normal hartree fock calculation. And here's the, you can see the hydrogen moving back and forth. This is the dominant uh, motion that you see in the, at the transition state. Now in NEO, we treat only this transferring hydrogen nucleus quantum mechanically, but now it's gone, right? So it can't be part of the imaginary mode anymore, right? Because the Hessian doesn't depend on it. And so in NEO, our imaginary mode looks like this. You see, there's no, there's no hydrogen, it disappeared because it's now like an electron. But what's really interesting is if you look at the rest of the mode, it actually agrees very well with the conventional one. So you see that we're getting some of the physics here we're getting the modes that actually facilitate hydrogen transfer. And if we then go back to neo hartree fock V, where we extend our Hessian to, um, in terms of the um, expectation value of this transferring hydrogen, we can then get the, the full extended Hessian, diagonalize that and get the um, imaginary mode. And you can see that it's identical to the conventional hartree fock mode. This is the overlay, you can't even tell the difference. They're, they're basically identical. Now we can use this transition state then to get a minimum energy path. And that's what we do here. This is a neo hartree fock is in blue and hartree fock is in red. You can see the barrier is slightly lower for, um, for NEO because we're including the effects of the hydrogen zero point energy. 
But what's more interesting is looking at the intrinsic reaction coordinate, because we know that the, the physical uh, meaning of this IRC for the conventional Hartree-Fock case will be the motion of the hydrogen, right? It's gonna be moving back and forth. But for Neo, that hydrogen is quantum. So instead, the IRC is really a reflection of the motions of the classical nuclei that are facilitating the hydrogen transfer. This is analogous to electron transfer, where the IRC would be the nuclei that are facilitating electron transfer. And so in this case, we can look at these, these coordinates and we can see that it corresponds to the tetrahedral to planar rearrangement around these central carbon atoms. Each one of these is going from sp3 to sp2 or vice versa along this reaction coordinate from the transition state either direction. And we can see this because we plotted here the, um, the structures along this, this uh, minimum energy path. And in addition to the structures, we plotted the uh, orbitals, the protonic orbitals, this little pink sphere here, the electronic intrinsic bond orbital that's relevant to the, to the reaction is shown in this red blue, lighter red blue. And what you can see here is that the quantum proton is moving concertedly with CH bond breaking and forming. You can see this movie here, it's a little bit mesmerizing, I realize. But uh, what's nice about the movie is you can really see that these carbons are changing sp3 to sp2, and that's really the dominant mode along the IRC. And you can also see this concerted behavior of the electron and the hydrogen. There could be some cases in the PCET reaction where the electron and the hydrogen nucleus are not moving in this concerted way, in a synchronous way, and this asynchronous behavior could be identified and analyzed in this kind of a framework. So that's where we're heading with this. Now, what if we want to do dynamics? Well, for this, we've developed um, real-time NEO-TDDFT methods, where we propagate the mixed nuclear electronic time-dependent Schrodinger equation numerically to get dynamics beyond the Born-Oppenheimer approximation. So we start out with this uh, product form of the wave function, right? the product of an electronic and a nuclear Slater determinant that we had before. And now we just plug it into the time-dependent Schrodinger equation instead of the time-independent one. And we get these two time-dependent equations, which again are very strongly coupled because these Fock matrices depend on both the electronic and the protonic coefficients, exactly what we had before, but now we're doing it in time. And so for real-time NEO, we can just solve the time-dependent equation numerically. And first we did this for fixed classical nuclei. And if you look at this example, we applied it to HCN, we can compute the electronic and vibrational excitation energies from the Fourier transform of the time-dependent electronic and protonic dipole moments. And you see that here's the, the dipole moment is a function of time. This is comparing NEO TDDFT to, to just regular conventional TDDFT. And they agree only for a few femtoseconds before you can see these deviations. That's due to vibronic coupling between the electron and the proton. And then if we look at the electronic spectra here, you just Fourier transform this, we can get uh, the, um, this is again comparing NeoTDDFT and TDDFT. The lower states, as I mentioned before, are in good agreement between conventional and Neo. But when we get up here, you see these splittings between the peaks for NeoTDDFT. These splittings also represent vibronic coupling between the electron and the proton. And that's only for the ex higher excited um, vibronic states. Now we can also look at vibrational spectra. And in this case, we're just looking at TDHF and TDDFT and the lower, the lower peaks correspond to the bend and the upper peaks correspond to the stretch. And so one reason for doing this is we can test the code. We can, we can test that the real time Neo TDDFT agrees with the linear response Neo TDDFT, which it does. I'll point out that the real time work is in collaboration with Xiao Song Li's group at the uh, University of Washington. And Lu Ning Zhao is the um, first author of this work. Also Coraline Tao and, and Fabian Pavosevich from my group are also involved in Andrew Wildman from Xiao Song's group. So this is very much of a, of a collaborative effort. So this is great that it agrees with our linear response Neo TDDFT, but of course one advantage of real-time methods is you can actually look at non-equilibrium dynamics. So here's an example where we use it to look at the ultra-fast vibrational excitation driven by an electric field pulse. This is relevant to time-resolved IR spectroscopy. So in this case, we applied first an off-resonant driving field. That's the, um, the blue curve here. And you can see that after the field is turned off around here, the blue, blue curve is just flat, right? Nothing is really happening. It has a negligible effect. But if we apply a resonant driving field, this 2162 nanometer, that's resonant with the CH stretch in HCN, then we see that there's absorption of the energy. And it's this red curve. We see these, these oscillations of the proton dipole moment. And we can, in fact, analyze the time dependence of these oscillations and get information that would be relevant to the resolved IR spectroscopy. Now, we can also look at excited state intramolecular proton transfer. So this system here, photoexcitation leads to proton transfer. This is photoexcitation to an excited electronic state. 
Now we can model this by moving an electron from the highest occupied molecular orbital to the lowest occupied, unoccupied. So from the homo to the lumo, basically, in this case. And then we can just do real time dynamics. Now, if we do that for the ground state geometry, we find that the proton doesn't, doesn't transfer when we move that electron up to the lumo. And this is because we need nuclear rearrangement to induce proton transfer. So the way we got around that is, is basically um, Lu Ning Zhao, that's the first author in this paper, he um, optimized the geometry in the excited electronic state, maintaining the hydrogen bonded to the donor, so fixing that. And then we get a geometry that when we go to excite it by moving the, from the electron from the homo to the lumo, now we get proton transfer. And you can see this because this blue curve corresponds to the proton leaving, you know, moving away from the donor, and the red curve corresponds to the proton moving toward the acceptor. So this is, this is a proton transfer reaction that was photoinduced to the excited electronic state. But in this case, all of the classical nuclei were fixed, and that's why we had to use this geometry that was um, optimized for the excited electronic state. If we really want to look at the dynamics, we want to let those classical nuclei move. And the way to do this is to do neo ehrenfest dynamics, where we allow the classical nuclei to follow Newton's equations of motion with a mean field potential obtained from our neo A function. So these first two equations here are exactly what I showed before for the real time neo methods. They're just the, for the quantum subsystem of electrons and protons. And this next equation here is for the classical subsystem. You can see that the classical nuclei are moving according to an average potential, according to the neo wave function. Now for proton transfer reactions, we might need to move the basis functions and we can use a semi-classical treatment for, for that. And that's described in this paper here. And we found that the molecular vibrational frequencies for HCN and other couple of other molecules computed with uh, this neo real time TDDFT Ehrenfest method agrees with our neo DFTV method that I talked about earlier. Again, that's just a, a check that everything is being done correctly and consistently. But what we can do with uh, this, this new Ehrenfest dynamics method is um, this neo Ehrenfest dynamics will enable the calculation of non equilibrium, non adiabatic dynamics. So that's really where we're heading. We want to be able to look at photo-induced intramolecular proton transfer, for example, this is the system I showed earlier, just a couple slides ago, where you photo-excite this molecule to an excited electronic state. And now we, we, this, this, this picture here, this is a movie of how the electronic density shown in green and blue here is coupled to the proton density shown in white here. Protons are moving quite a bit slower and how they're coupled to each other. Now in this particular movie, this was with fixed classical nuclei but now we're able to do this with, with moving classical nuclei. So we can look at, again, using that neo Ehrenfest dynamics, we can look at how the classical nuclei are, are interacting with the electronic and protonic densities as well. So this will allow us to look at non-equilibrium dynamics of photo-induced intramolecular proton transfer or PCET. And the advantage is we're including the non-adiabatic effects between the electrons and the protons in the neo part. And between the classical nuclei and the electron-proton subsystem, all those non-adiabatic effects are being included via this Ehrenfest dynamics. So we think we'll be able to, to learn a lot from doing these kinds of calculations. Now that's all DFT. We've also developed wave function based methods. And this, this work was um, done largely by, uh, by Fabian Pavosevich in my group, where um, you, you have to define a cluster operator that now includes um, not only the single and double excitations for electrons, but also single and double excitations for protons and double excitations for an electron and a proton. So we need to include all of these, and you can do either configuration interaction or CCSD type methods. Um, Fabian derived and implemented this whole series of, of methods. I won't, won't read them aloud. But what he found is that NEO CCSD and, and, and the Bruckner orbital and orbital optimized uh, variants provide accurate proton densities, proton affinities, and optimized geometries. And the advantage over DFT is that it doesn't require any parameterization. So that's a big advantage in terms of having a gold standard for NEO. But it's expensive. And so one way to get around that is to use orbital optimized second order molar plus perturbation theory. We call it NEO OOMP2. Now this isn't quite as accurate as the CCSD, um, but it's much faster. But then we said, okay, let's take inspiration from Martin Headgordon's work on um, doing this SOS, the scaled opposite spin OOMP2 in conventional electronic structure theory. Well, we can use it for NEO. And in fact, this little prime here means that we have introduced an additional scaling of the electron-proton correlation. So we have one three parameter then. And we found that this actually leads to quite good proton densities. You can see that here. The, uh, the um, green curve is OOMP2 and the uh, blue curve is OOCCD. 
And um, it's not quite as good as OSCCD, but still very good. And then in terms of the uh, proton um, affinities, these are proton affinities for a set of molecules, very close, 0.04 versus 0.05 EV. So we're approaching couple cluster accuracy at a much lower cost. So we can implement it at the end of the fourth scaling instead of end of the sixth scaling. So this we think is a promising direction. I'll also point out that Fabian has, has used density fitting with Neo CCSD and he's able to look at a protonated water tetramer with all nine protons quantum with a reasonably large basis set. So we are making progress here. He's also developed Neo EOM CCSD, so equation of motion to get excited states in both the frequency and time domains and apply this to HCN. So again, all electrons in the hydrogen are quantum. And what's interesting here is that this, this method um, shows combination bands. So we call this 110, that's the, the um, excitation of both bending modes. And you can see this peak right here shows up. And also an overtone, um, 200, that corresponds to the excitation of one of the bending modes to a second excited state. And more interestingly, we can see double excitations, simultaneous excitation of an electron and a proton. So in other words, we're, these blue arrows show your photo exciting from the ground state to an excited electronic state and an excited vibrational state within that electronic state. And um, these would not show up at all. They don't show up at all with neo TDDFT, this linear response, but we see them now with this neo EOM CCSD. They're, they're much too high in energy, but at least they exist. And so we're still exploring different options for looking at some of these double excitations, which I think are gonna be very important for, um, for looking at uh, these kinds of systems. Now, I haven't said much about hydrogen tunneling, but we are very interested in hydrogen tunneling. The challenge here is that we need to describe bilocal delocalized wave functions. So for example, in malonaldehyde, the ground state is symmetric and the excited state is anti-symmetric by global delocalized wave function. And to describe these, we need multi-reference approaches. And one possibility is CAS SEF, which requires extremely large active spaces and it's very computationally expensive. We did this back in 2002, but, but uh, found that it was, it was actually quite, uh, you really need to use a huge active space that makes it a little bit intractable, although perhaps now, 18 years later, it could be. But what we've done recently is Neo MSDFT, that stands for multi state DFT. When we were inspired by the work of Jolly Gao and coworkers um, in electronic structure theory, and this is a way to include both dynamical and non dynamical correlation. So, what we do is we calculate two localized nuclear electronic wave functions with Neo DFT, these two green ones on the left side here. And then we need to just diagonalize a two by two Hamiltonian, where the diagonal terms are the just the neo DFT energies of these two localized states. The off diagonal terms are motivated, physically motivated, um, similar to what uh, Jolly Gao has done. And then we just mix them through this, uh, through this Hamiltonian to get these mixed bilobal states. And so in other words, we're doing a kind of non-orthogonal CI approach to, to mix these two states, just with two, two uh, basis functions, these two localized neo DFT states. And it actually does quite well. So this is an example of malonaldehyde and acetoacid aldehyde. Comparing to a grid-based reference, these are wave numbers. So these are really, really good within six wave numbers. Here's benzyl toluene compared, again, tunneling splitting at different carbon-carbon distances, so moving them apart. Now, I want to emphasize that to get this level of quantitative accuracy, we needed to apply a, a correction to the overlap term. And the reason for that is that if you look here at malonaldehyde and, and the other one here, we, um, the black curve is the reference, that's the true proton density for the, the, the delocalized uh, ground state and excited state. And you can see that if we do just non-orthogonal CI with hartree flock references, that's the blue curve, we get way too localized um, states and there's two separated. Red is neo MSDFT, so that does much better, but it's not perfect. And because it's not perfect, we had to apply this, this one correction factor, but we apply the same one for all system study. So it's not like we're fitting it to each system, it's one correction and then we're done. And it seems to work very well across those many different systems that we've studied. And I'll also point out that uh, for this asymmetric tunneling system here, this acetoacid aldehyde, if you just use hartree fock basis functions, the localized hartree fock solutions, you get this blue curve and you only have density on one side. You don't even have density on the other side. Whereas with MSDFT, you do get the density on the other side, similar to what you get in the reference. So we're at least getting the right physics here and dynamical correlation is very, very important in getting these tunneling splittings correct. So I've told you about uh, the, the, the progress with the NEO method where we can incorporate the nuclear quantum effects and the non-born Oppenheimer effects into quantum chemistry calculations in a computationally efficient way. 
These EPC-17 and 19 functionals are producing accurate proton densities and energies. NEO-DFT is giving us optimized geometries, energies, minimum energy paths, and thermochemistry. NEO-TDDFT is giving us electronic, proton vibrational, and vibronic excitation energies. NEO-DFT-V will give us uh, molecular frequencies that include the anharmonic effects of the quantum protons and for the whole molecule. And then these various wave function methods are, are, are moving along as well. The MSDFT method is useful for hydrogen tunneling splittings and vibronic couplings, and the neo Ehrenfest dynamics in these real-time NEO methods allow us to calculate vibronic spectra and the nuclear electronic dynamics for non-equilibrium processes. And these are the kinds of systems we want to be able to study. The ones down here, we still have some problems and some issues to sort out. So although we've made progress, that we have a long ways to go and, and much work to be done. So none of this would have been possible without the, the amazing people who, who, who did the work. Um, these are this is these are the list of people from the beginning. Simon Webb was the initial person in my group back in 2002 to work on this. Um, Kurt Gorson and Yang Yang um, worked on the uh, EPC functionals. Uh, Tanner and Yang here um, worked on the uh, TDDFT methods. Uh, Kurt and Yang are now now have their own groups in Missouri and Wisconsin. Um, Patrick did work on the um, analytic Hessians and the minimum energy paths. Coralines worked on TDDFT and gradients of TDDFT, so now we can do some, some dynamics. Fabian, I mentioned, with the in the wave function methods. Uh, ben is working, uh, making good strides on the uh, OOMP2 methods. She did the MSDFT work, and Shashato joined us very recently, and he's going to work on dynamics. And we're grateful to John Tully for all of his wisdom. And again, Xiao Song Li and his group for their, their contributions to the real time aspects. And this work was funded by the NSF and also the DOE um, SIDAC program. And I just want to mention NEO methods are in, some of them are in games, almost all of them are in QChem. The real-time methods are in Cronus Q. So thank you very much. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Sharon. Very, very interesting. I enjoyed this, really. Uh, there are quite a number of uh, questions on the q and I'm going to select two and, and, and one of my own. So I start here with a question from Jury, uh, who asks, Hi, for the practical calculation, do you localize the proton basis set close to where you know the proton should be or not? How is it done? Well, in, 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 um, it depends on the problem, but in many cases, if we're just doing a geometry optimization, we'll just optimize the basis function center variationally. And so that, that would be how we would do it. During dynamics, you, you might want it to move. And in that case, there are different approaches. Like I mentioned, the semi-classical approach where you can integrate the, the, the equations of motion for the nuclear basis function center. That is in a paper that's just coming out um, now in JCP. Um, and that's, that's another option. There are other options we're exploring for how to move them during dynamics. But in general, in a, in a, in we, we optimize them variationally if we're just looking at the neo potential energy surface. Um, there could be other ways. Sometimes, for example, for the hydrogen tunneling systems, we need two basis function centers, right? Uh, so one, if you think of the hydrogen moving in a double well, symmetric double well, potentially you need one at the minimum of each well. So there are some challenges, technical challenges associated with that, and we are addressing them, but we still have, have some issues to address. Thank you. Uh, here's another one from Daniel. So for NEO-DFT parenthesis V, can it be adapted to include ro-vibrational, ro-vibronic coupling? In principle, there could be ways to do that. We specifically actually didn't want to include the, ro the, 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 the couplings to rotations, and that's one reason that, uh, that when we do these, uh, you know, that the NEO method, we try to treat some nuclei classically. Um, I think it's certainly possible mathematically to start to couple in the rotations if you wanted to treat, say, all nuclei quantum mechanically, and maybe some of the nuclei would literally just have one basis function center, and they could move, and then you could uh, you could try to you know, mix in these rotations. We have not tried to do that. I, I'm I'm sure there is a way to do it, but we haven't we haven't done it ourselves. Okay, now to uh, uh, one of my questions. So I couldn't help but noticing you almost exclusively handled one proton at a time. I wonder if, if with the technique you have developed, you could, for instance, look at the uh, protonic wave function in H2 and possibly compute things like nuclear cross-sections and see the potential for cold fusion, etc. This is a really hot topic where this is also done with another heavy particle, the muon. 
Yeah, we have we have done actually quite a few systems with multiple quantum protons, but say water molecules. Um, we've done water protonated water tetramers, like I mentioned, with all nine protons quantum. We've even done hexamers with, with NeoDFT, so um, with 12 quantum protons. So we can do those. I didn't show those here um, due to sort of short, short um, time. But uh, in terms of doing H2 or something, if, if both protons are quantum, we're going to have this issue of rotations and translations mixing in. So as long as you come up with a mathematical way to remove those, then uh, you, you certainly could do that. Um, it's not something that we've really pursued. We're mostly interested in looking at the slightly, you know, some larger molecules where some of the nuclei are classical to, to keep uh, you know, to, to keep things a little bit more computationally um, efficient. And also to, you know, one of the goals is really to make this so that the whole chemistry community can use this. They could do the way, the same way they do a regular DFT calculation, they could do neo-DFT by just, you know, clicking, their, changing their input file in one of these, these standard quantum chemistry codes. So yes, you could do those kinds of, you know, what you're talking about, fairly complicated um, problems with, with everything quantum um, and I think some of these methods would definitely be transferable to that, but it's not a direction that we've really um, looked in. We've looked at positrons on molecules, but again, we still have some classical nuclei. We have positrons and electrons quantum. So that's kind of the, the exotic particle um, method, you know, applications we've looked at so far. But yeah, I think there's a lot of different directions people could go with these. So I think it would be great if someone did explore that. All right. So I urge you to go to the Q&A. There are qu actually quite a number of questions. I don't think it's because your presentation was unclear, rather the re reverse. People understood it clearly and have questions. So uh, thank you again. With that, we're about to close the second session for today. So now again, we're going to have an intermission of one hour. Uh, most of you guys going to drop off and have coffee or eat something. We will come back at uh, 1800 hours Central European time. That's 6 p.m. Central European time, where we're going to have the last two uh, presentations of today. The first one will be by William H. Miller from uh, uh, Berkeley. And uh, the last thing we save the best for the last is the lecture by the 2019 Levdeen lecturer, Nancy Macri. So I see you all here again in about an hour. Thank you very much.